Okay, so we're going to be talking about uh, shafts. And uh, when we're talking about shafts, we're really talking about fatigue. Uh, so again, fatigue is what happens when you have repeated loading and unloading, varying loads over time that generates failure at stress levels that are still well below uh, the level that would cause failure in a static test. So again, it's called fatigue because back in the day before they realized what was going on, they, they called it fatigue because the, the metal was getting tired and eventually broke. Because um, they, did, they did at least realize it was a uh, time-based thing. So the longer you used the part, the more likely it was to break via fatigue. What's actually happening is that there's tiny microscopic cracks at some sort of critical point that grow over time. Uh, so with each each repeated load, those cracks get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, until eventually they get to the point where the part itself can't handle the uh, stress anymore, and it just breaks. And it breaks in a brittle fashion, unlike unlike uh, what you would expect to see with a uh, static. Uh, uh, static test, even even inductive materials. So again, uh, these critical points are basically where you have the highest stress levels, the highest localized stress levels. So generally speaking, we're talking at some sort of discontinuity where you have a stress concentration factor of five. So uh, if we want to talk about how we uh, kind of uh, design safe shafts, <laughs> then we need to talk about what fatigue strength is. So here's what we call more test apparatus. And what it does is it has the capability to basically uh, apply a pure bending moment in the middle there. So basically you got, uh, you got the shaft, you've got uh, two supports, uh, two outer supports and two inner, and then these two inner uh, supports here, and then a weight is applied to that inner support. So the uh, <clears throat> so essentially, uh, and then you got this electric motor, and you just apply the weight, which causes a bending moment uh, in on on this center here. And then, of course, what, based upon that, at the geometric location, you're going to get, because, because you're applying this bending moment, what's going to happen is you're going to get a positive tensile strength, uh, tensile stress, on the bottom here, and you're going to get compressive at the top. But if we look at a cross-section of that, so again, Tensile here, positive, compressive at the top, negative. But as you rotate the shaft, you know, this point here that was initially tensile is going to move. So it's going to move, and then the stress level at the physical point on the shaft is going to fluctuate. That stress level is going to fluctuate up and down. So stress level over time at that point or at any of the points there is going to fluctuate up and down from a positive to a negative uh, uh, normal stress. And then basically uh, you repeat that, you repeat that, and then you're going to get little cracks that grow with each application of the tensile uh, load. And <clears throat> You just count how many uh, how many revolutions you get to the point until uh, it breaks. So eventually it's going to break, and then uh, this thing will drop. This contact here will will open, so the motor the motor knows to stop turning at the point when it breaks. Here's just another example. Test specimen test specimen in here. Weight applied such that uh, it's, a, it's an even bending load in the middle. So yeah. No shear in the middle. 
so the moment in the middle is a pure constant moment all across here. So based upon that, you'd, you'd expect the failure to be right in the middle, directly in the center, because that's where the uh, diameter is the smallest, thus that's where the stress level is the highest. You get this variation over time. And essentially, uh, based upon the magnitude of that uh, variation, so based upon what your stress level is, you tend to get uh, it lasting a certain amount. Now, uh, I am going to say I, I have a philosoph philosophical issue with the manner in which they set up these, these stress life diagrams, because realistically, the life here is the, in, is the dependent variable. What you're changing here is this. And then you get a certain life bit as a function of the stress that you apply. But you know that, that that's that's kind of neither here nor there. Uh, this is the standard uh, way that these things are represented, so we'll stick with that. So uh, there's two there's typically two types of behavior you have a tendency to get. Uh, Ferrous materials, so stuff made out of iron, will have what we call an endurance limit. So then, essentially, basically, uh, the lifespan of the material for lifespan of the material for a particular stress level uh, starts off high. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, when you when you have a high stress, when you apply high stress, the life cycle, the life the span starts off low. And then as you drop the stress level, the lifespan increases until you get to the point, until you get to a certain point at which when you drop the stress level below that point, we meet the endurance limit. And essentially past that point, it is staying indefinitely. So we can estimate an infinite lifespan for that uh, component. We don't have a tendency to see that with ferrous, oh, non-ferrous materials. So stuff like aluminum, brass, so on and so forth. Uh, no matter how low you drop the, st the stress, eventually it's going to break. So here's, here's just an example of kind of the uh, test data that was used to generate uh, the SN curve for this particular type of steel. So as you can see, like the, the, the line they drew here is relatively conservative too. So you know, all, there's a few dots that are kind of predicting a um, uh, predicting a higher uh, lifespan than the uh, uh, yeah, a few dots that are predicting a higher lifespan than what the line says uh, based upon the stress level applied, but uh, not many. Uh, so essentially, uh, yeah, we can uh, um, uh, yeah, this uh, based upon this, we can basically use this as a reasonable estimate of how long we expect our component to last based upon how uh, how much we're going to be uh, uh, how much we're going to be loading it up and the endurance limit happens at a stress level that we call sn prime and the stress level for sn prime is for steels generally half of the ultimate strength level which also correlates to its Brinell's hardness number as well. And here's, uh, here's something similar for uh, some aluminum alloys. So as you see, we, we have a tendency to get, uh, I guess what is kind of a linear section in here. And then 
and uh, eventually it stops being linear and kind of starts flattening out a little bit. Uh, it doesn't, it never flattens out completely. Like you never get to a point where it, uh, where you get uh, infinite lifespan, like you have a tendency to be able to uh, do so with your uh, steels. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, some, some numbers. Uh, so, so basically, each of those stress levels corresponds to an expected number of lifespan, uh, ex expected lifespan. So for steels, anything higher than 10 to the 6, 10 to the 6 is basically where, the, where you have that cutoff point, where, the, uh, where to get higher than uh, a million cycles, you're going to need to be below the uh, endurance limit. Your SN prime. You need you need to have your stress level below SN prime, so below the 0.5 SU. 10 to the three cycles. Uh, you tend to be able to last that long, a thousand cycles, which again, depending upon your application, may or may not be very long at all. Uh, you tend to see that at 0.9 of the SU. Now, I'd like to point out that. At 0.9 SU, you're also likely getting at least a little bit of yielding each cycle, as opposed to something like this, where uh, you know it's it's also low enough that you're not exceeding the yield limit. Uh, so for cast iron, uh, cast iron tends to be slightly have a slightly lower endurance limit than. Uh, uh, than your uh, than wrought steel, and again aluminum alloys. You're you're essentially matching up the values at uh, for a particular number of cycles. So, for example, if you want to last five times ten to the eight cycles, then you need to be below 0.4 SU. And then similarly here, each particular stress level corresponds to a particular number of cycles for these materials. So, uh, and this is basically kind of what we're what we're getting at with the with the uh, tests done on the more test specification. We're going to be loading them up based upon how much weight is applied and the, and the size and shape of the uh, test specimen. We're going to be loading it up and we're going to be doing it till it breaks and then each one of those, you know, based, based upon the stress level that we see, we expect it to last a certain number of cycles. Now, this is all obtained, again, based upon following the test specifications. So again, uh, that goes with a sample with a particular shape and dimensions, a highly polished external, external surface, well-controlled loading, and lab environmental conditions. So again, those, those are basically our perfect conditions. And we all know that any real life conditions don't match those, so we're going to need to adjust uh, slightly in order to uh, kind of account for the fact that our real life conditions don't match those. So we have a few correction factors we apply. So our SN is going to be equal, is our corrected endurance limit. And again, we're talking an endurance limit, so this applies, uh, you know, this is uh, talking about steel. So essentially, um, we're taking our SN prime and multiplying it by these factors that basically bump the uh, change, change what we expect the stress level to be for the particular number of cycles that we uh, that we're look, looking for. So uh, first of them is the load factor. So the load factor for bending is what because the test is conducted in bending so the the test matches what we expect to see uh, axial tends to be a bit worse that's basically because you know when you're doing a bending test you get the 
you get the stress level at a particular point going up and down, up and down, up and down. Axial, on the other hand, essentially you're you're causing that to occur. You know, for for the bending test, this could be at a particular point. Uh, the stress level is going to only get only going to be the maximum at a particular point at any one time. Whereas when you do an axial one, you hit the maximum stress across the entire surface of the uh, component, uh, across the entire cross section. So it, uh, it, can, it tends to be a bit worse. Uh, torsion. Uh, torsion is, uh, bas that's basically, uh, uh, what we're doing there is we're basically uh, taking the uh, shear stress levels that we calculate and transforming them into the uh, von Mises equivalent for uh, uh, for if it was bending instead, essentially. So uh, you know we're we're seeing shear stress, but we we know that what's happening you know it's not shear that uh, that uh, is causing the uh, cracks to be forming. It's the it's kind of the tensile equivalent. Uh, so we, we need to kind of adjust for that. So that that's what the torsion correction factor is for. Uh, we get the gradient factor. <clears throat> and the gradient factor essentially is accounting for the fact that uh, a smaller components see the stress level drop off faster. So if you have a uh, so if you have the bending, you know, if we have a large component and we're applying some sort of bending moment to it, then we're going to see some sort of stress distribution like this, right? So, and, and essentially, if we, if we consider, say, this level to be an area of high stress, then the area of high stress goes, uh, it is larger. So there's a larger area of high stress, so it's able to, you know, the cracks will grow, will, will kind of grow deeper faster. Whereas if you have a smaller component, that's like this, the, the stress level, the maximum stress level might be the same, but it's going to drop off faster. So the gradient will be higher. So maybe, you know, instead of the stress level being... Uh, you know, this, this high stress level area here being, I don't know, maybe about five millimeters deep, maybe on something, maybe on something this size, it's only 1.25 millimeters deep, something like that. So essentially, uh, for the larger components, we expect to see a lower stress, uh, a lower endurance limit. So the larger the components is, the lower the maximum stress that we can apply to it as part of our bending is. So a small component is going to be essentially matching what occurs in the test, uh, you know, in the more test uh, conditions, whereas when we get larger, it gets worse. Uh, we also got uh, we call it a, a surface factor. Oh, so yeah, this is yeah, like we said, the the smaller the components are, kind of the steeper the gradient is. So the less actual physical space the high stress areas take up. Uh, we've also got the surface factors. So basically, this is kind of uh, yeah, the rougher the surface is the um, more likely there is to be little bits where, you know, little disparities where you tend to see cracks start to form. So if it's a mirror polished up at the top here, then our surface, our surface factor is one because that's matching the test conditions in the Moore's uh, test apparatus. Uh, if we have something that isn't mirror polished, then essentially uh, 
it's going to be worse than if it was mere polished and how worse how, how much worse it is depends upon the ultimate strength of the material in question so uh, kind of those two things combine together uh, <clears throat> in order to uh, uh, kind of increase these the effect that the surface effect has so if you have an exceptionally strong material but with a weak but with a really bad finish it's you know it's a uh, the surface effect has more of an the, the, the surface factor has more of an effect than if you had a weaker material with a poor surface finish. So there's a few kind of uh, lines here, uh, and again, this is uh, found in Juveniles in chapter eight, 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 thirteen. So if it's a commercially polished one, uh, up to a certain amount, it kind of stays at 0 0.9 and then drops down. Uh, once you get past, uh, you know, like 200 KSI for the SU. Uh, if you have a cold drawn machined one, then, uh, you know, it could be up here. Hot rolled is up here, as forged down, uh, down at the bottom here. So anyways, um, and then the last thing that we have is uh, a reliability factor. And that's kind of going back to what we uh, had discussed before about how kind of the strength of materials is based upon uh, a number of samples taken. You know, number of experiments were done uh, and you're pumping out a certain number. Uh, and uh, the degree to which that uh, uh, every to the, the degree to which every single sample you need uh, every single sample uh, uh, a, a, well, here is that you're getting this you're, you're getting basically a normal distribution or you, you should be getting a normal distribution of the actual strength no, 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 there's no don't have that. So you get some sort of mean and you get some sort of distribution and essentially uh, if what you're saying is is if I need uh, if I need this part to last a certain amount and I need to make sure almost all of these parts last that long then essentially what we're saying is all right in order to get that amount of reliability uh, we need to kind of shift uh, how much uh, how much we're, we're, we're uh, what, what sort of stress level we're, we're actually imposing such that we capture uh, capture the entire amount here whereas if we only need 50% reliability then you know using the mean value uh, for the for the basically the ultimate strength, uh, will uh, will work just fine. So the, the you know the the more the higher percentage of the parts you need to last at least this long, uh, the higher uh, sorry the, the lower your reliability factor needs to be. So the lower stress level you're, you're going to need need to apply. <clears throat> so if you bump it yeah if you if you bump down the stress level on your component to about 25.3% uh, of what the stress level would be for the average component to fail at a particular number of cycles, then you can expect almost all, 99.9% .9 of the components that you make will last that long as well. So applying these, so we're going to be designing shafts. Um, typically speaking, uh, you can generally expect almost all shafts to have some sort of bending moment applied to them and some sort of torque load applied to them. Uh, some of them will have axial loads as well. So stress concentrations come into play too. Uh, so, 
essentially the, the one on the left here, you know, it's a nice gradual reduction in the, in the diameter here. So essentially in the area we're worried about, there's no stress concentration. Whereas if we do something like this instead, right, we have a very abrupt transition to the lowest diameter, uh, then that stress concentration uh, will increase the apparent maximum strength at the at where the at the point where the cracks are growing, and the thing will last the less time as a result. So we call this correction factor Kf, the F for fatigue, and that's just the ratio of kind of the Sn prime based upon the Moore's test and the Sn prime if we have a notch. Now, the thing is, is that uh, the Kf is not necessarily going to be uh, the same as the KTs that we calculated uh, kind of in the last lecture. And so the, the, the stress concentration factors, uh, the KTs, are basically a function of the geometry only. So those can be calculated just based upon these dimensionless ratios, the R over D and the D over D. <clears throat> and there's a few formulas where you can kind of approximate those uh, as well. But uh, it's not necessarily the case uh, for uh, fatigue. And, and this kind of makes sense because essentially these stress concentration factors, you know, they've all got lines that are going like this, right? Essentially, for all of these, when you get to an R over D value of zero, these, these stress con these KTs, they all approach infinity. So that means that if you had a perfectly smooth, like, you know, assume that this was a perfectly, assume that we had a perfectly smooth line. We'll pretend that's perfectly smooth. But there is a tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic flaw there. The tiniest of microscopic scopic flaws. You know, maybe it, maybe it was uh, three molecules out of place. Based upon this, that, that type of notch there would cause an infinite stress concentration factor, which would cause this thing to, uh, if it, you know, which, you know, if we just applied that, we'd expect instant failure, which obviously isn't the case. So uh, the KTs are a function of kind of these dimensionless ratios only. Uh, so here's the KT for, for bending on that shaft. Here's the KT for torsion. Different KTs for the different loading conditions. Same deal for yeah, these, these different setups, notches, and so on and so forth. But uh, the KFs are a function of the KT and what we call a Q value, the notch sensitivity uh, factor. So basically, uh, those depend upon not only the, uh, so, so the fatigue stress concentration factor depends not only upon the KT, the plane stress concentration factor, but this Q. And that Q is a function of the notch radius, the, the actual physical size of the notch radius, not some ratio, the actual notch radius, and what sort of, uh, and the basically the ultimate strength of the, of the material, of the steel you're working with. So, uh, these ones are used uh, uh, if you're having a bending or axial load. 
or if you're having a, a torsional load, then use these these values. Uh, sorry, the, the, these these values correspond to the lines here if for torsion, and then use uh, those ones for uh, bending and axial loads. So if you have a you know a material that has an ultimate strength of 80 uh, ksi, then you would use this line here. This line here for your bending and your axial loads, and then you use this line here for your torsional loads. The one above it. Other things that often come up, uh, keyways. Uh, so keys are basically uh, grooves cut in the shaft that allow you to uh, kind of mount gears such on, uh, mount gears and bearings and so on and so forth on them. So basically, there's a couple ways, there's two main ways that they're cut, a sled runner or an end mill profiled, profiled keyway or a sled run, runner keyway. And uh, both of those will end up with different stress concentration factors for, oh, for bending and for torsion. Also based upon <clears throat> whether or not we're talking high strength or low strength. So. Uh, Hard, a hardened, quenched and drawn uh, material will have a higher stress, uh, fatigue stress concentration factor than uh, the, uh, for in, in a key way, than the as annealed uh, condition. <clears throat> and then, uh, oh yeah, that's important. Yeah, you calculate the nominal stress based upon uh, the pre the, the pre-cut cross section, not necessarily based upon, not necessarily including the the material for the key, cut it for the keyway. So uh, the other thing that needs to be taken into account is that you don't always have uh, a perfect bending moment. Uh, you know, it's not always going to be fluctuating about zero. You could have some mean stress. So you might have, you know, this, this would be, uh, this would be with a mean stress of zero. And at that stress level, we'd expect that the failure would occur at SN. Whereas if we have something like this going on here, where our stress level is very high, on average and has some fluctuation, then we expect that uh, we're going to get different failure going on there. <clears throat> so uh, the both the mean and the amplitude of that stress variation is going to come into play. When our mean is zero, then the strength is just based upon the amplitude only, and that's equal. Uh, but if the stress is, you know, if the, if the mean is non-zero, based upon kind of our min and our max, then we are going to get uh, some sort of different uh, failure uh, occurring. <clears throat> so we have uh, what we call a stress ratio. Stress ratio. Oh, I don't know why that damn thing keeps doing that. Our stress ratio is the ratio between the minimum and the maximum. So some uh, stress ratios that uh, 
might pop up more than others. Uh, you have a maximum stress of zero and a minimum stress of some value, uh, then that'll be a negative something divided by zero. So that'll be, that'll be in, uh, negative infinity. If you have a stress value where, sorry, a stress ratio where you have the minimum stress is some value and the maximum stress is the same value but positive, that's an R negative one. If you have the, uh, val if you have the stress dropping to zero and increasing to some amount, then you, the stress ratio is going to be zero over some amount, so that's equal to zero. And then if we just have a constant stress here, then that uh, stress ratio is just going to be equal to one. So no, no actual variation there. But uh, essentially, so there's a few theories kind of on uh, kind of estimates uh, done to try to determine like failure envelopes uh, based upon what sort of ratios you have for the amplitude of the stress and the mean of the stress. So the Goodman criteria uh, is kind of based upon a line that goes uh, from SN to SU. And then basically failure is expected uh, when those uh, uh, when the ratios for those, uh, basically any it, failure is expected when you plot your stress and value uh, based upon its particular SM and SA. And if your dot happens to be outside here, then failure is predicted. If it happens to be inside here, then failure is not predicted. Now we like to emphasize here that the SN that is used is the SN for the number of cycles that you want to be, uh, that you want your component to last. So if you want it to last an infinite amount, then we use, then, then the SN that you're going to be using is the, uh, is the endurance uh, limit. Uh, it could be S1000 or S10 to the 5. Anything that's S10 to the 6 and above that's four steels, that's going to be your endurance limit. So basically, and that's basically saying that uh, the uh, ultimate, the, the mean versus the ultimate strength kind of takes us, takes a chunk off the life uh, uh, as well as the ratio of the um, so uh, adding the adding mean stress takes away a certain amount of kind of the strength of the material, the 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 ability to carry a load of the material, and then adding the uh, ampl amplitude will determine how much is left for that part to last a certain number of uh, uh, a certain amount of time. I got the Soderberg failure criteria, so that is uh, more conservative than S than the Goodman. So as you recall, Goodman went had to line from S N to S U. Goodman was there. Soderberg saying, "Now let's draw that S to S Y." Uh, so as you can see, it's uh, far more conservative than uh, than Goodman was. We got Gerber. Uh, Gerber, Gerber wanted to go with a parabola, uh, so that would uh, that would determine kind of your failure criteria based upon this. That's just the, those are overimposed. Now, what we tend to use, uh, and what I'll be expecting you guys to use in this course, unless otherwise specified, is what's called the modified Goodman. So we're starting off uh, with 
a line that goes from Sn to Su. And then we're also plotting a line that goes from Sy to Sy. And then we're kind of doing uh, the worst case of those on the positive SM side. On the negative S SM side, essentially, uh, because we're if we're adding compressive stress, uh, it doesn't have as much of a tendency to uh, worsen fatigue uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, due to the fact that as you apply that compressive stress, it's kind of uh, keeping the material the cracks in the material closed. Uh, so you have more of a tendency. Uh, it, it doesn't, you know, we're not saying it necessarily helps completely. So, you know, we're not, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it do, doesn't keep going. It doesn't do something like this as a result. But uh, essentially, we're kind of able to kind of stay at that SN level until we kind of get to this point uh, where, we do, where we intersect this line from SY to SY. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, yeah. So essentially what you do is you kind of plot your uh, operating point and say, say your operating point's there. Uh, so essentially, if you draw a line from the origin to your operating point, that line will have a particular length. And if you draw a line from the origin through the operating point to that line there, that line will have a particular length. And then your safety factor is equal to the ratio, <laughs> the ratio of the lengths of those two lines. And you just got to keep in mind that uh, you need to check well, you need to know kind of which line is the failure criteria here. So, you know, if you're over, if your operating point is over here, then it's hitting this, then it's hitting the SN SU line first. Whereas if your operating point is over here, then it's going to be hitting, then it's going to be hitting the SY SY line first. So basically, uh, if you don't necessarily know which one of the, which one of those lines it's hitting, then you need to do your calculation for the safety factor based upon both of those criteria, and then your actual safety factor is just the lower of those two. And yeah, we'll uh, we'll uh, delve into that a bit more in the next video.